It's my great pleasure to introduce Deborah German from the University of Roehampton. Um, Deborah is the author and editor of a number of different books. Um, which are most recent. Can you remember them without notes? <laughs> I'm quite impressed that you're doing this without a crib I'm show. running about trying to find catering because there's supposed to be coffees turning up and that hasn't well, happened. <laughs> so welcome to, um, welcome to Winchester, everyone. Coffeeless Winchester. Um, your most recent book is called... Um, Women, Celebrity and Cultures of Ageing, Freeze Frame. With Sue Holmes, co-edited with Sue, who a number of you know, of course. Um, and today you're going to be talking about ageing women, invisibility and the old lady revolution and fabulous fashionistas. Indeed, you, yes, Deborah. yes. And in fact, <coughs> the stuff that I'm talking about today is largely taken from the chapter that's in that book. If you're interested, you can go to the book and read it all. So um, let's start with a little introduction to the film Fabulous Fashionistas. Uh, and this is taken from the, the opening of the film. And these are the words of the director, Sue Bourne. So if I can just um, come out of this. This is a film about six remarkable women with an average age of 80. I'm now 85 and I don't feel like slowing down yet. Six women to inspire us and show us that old age doesn't have to be grim and boring. I don't give a damn what people think of me or the way I dress. I dress for myself because I love style and design and colour. Women who can show us how to look a million dollars, even in clothes from charity shops. I think I would say I'm a bit unusual for my age. Six very stylish, very different women who haven't had Botox or plastic surgery. My goodness, the definition is good. We don't want too much definition. <laughs> they are redefining the aging process. They're doing it with attitude and a great wardrobe. I don't want to be too over the top. We can all learn a thing or two from these women. You know, I did this film with our old friend. He was very good, he taught me a lot. Not just about style, but about life itself and how to enjoy and make the most of whatever time we all have left. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm done now. Seven. So, in September 2013, the TV pages of the UK press went into something of a tailspin following Channel 4's broadcast of fabulous fashionistas on Cutting Edge. As you can surmise from the clip you've just seen, the film followed the stories of six women with an average age of 80 who had each rejected the cultural imperative to relinquish their interest in style and sartorial pleasure as they aged. Instead, each of them enthusiastically continued to pursue distinctive wardrobes and the gratifications of clothes, design and shopping. And evidently this account of ageing women refusing to disappear into the background struck a major cultural chord. The very fact of a group of women at this time in their lives being given a dedicated show on terrestrial TV was widely noted as striking, memorable, unfamiliar television. And indeed there were many calls for more of it. So during its transmission, the hashtag fabulous fashionistas began trending all over the UK uh, Guardian journalist Hadley Freeman and the fashion diversity activist Karen Franklin were both tweeting that they wanted to see this one-off documentary made into a series. And excitement and a, and a sense of kind of sheer joy in the programme abounded. The seemingly universal in the Twitterverse, time and again tweets invoked this programme as being inspirational. The press reviews appearing the next day continued in the same vein. So Rebecca Nicholson in The Guardian, for example, called it a delightful, delicate documentary. And Alison Lynch in Metro commented, it struck a profound note about what true style really is 
and how it can keep you young at heart. And today I want to think a little bit about why this film was deemed so significant in extending the media lexicon for discussing ageing femininities, reflecting what it achieved in pushing back some of the stereotypes and the limited repertoire of images of older women that are generally available to us, as well as thinking through some of the problems it arguably poses. So when we, when we push back against the cultural invisibility of older women, what are we advocating for? Does a seemingly burgeoning trend to adopt older women as models and reps in the fashion, makeup and perfume industries signify a move to greater diversity, where at last older women are being afforded greater presence in the public spaces these industries occupy? Or is this a retrograde step to ensure women stay on a relentless post-feminist trajectory of self-monitoring throughout the life course? Or might it be both? So first, a little bit more about the film. Uh, so it's structured around uh, individual profiles of each of the six women. We're told a little bit about their backstory and their biography. Um, the filmmaker Sue Bourne asks them each about their style and she films each of them kind of sharing the contents of their wardrobe. And since the film was aired, all of the women have been subject to a kind of endless rounds of interviews and invitations, becoming recognisable celebrities at an age when uh, already established women celebrities more often than not start to disappear from the public eye. And indeed, as part of this kind of round of endless in interviews, um, earlier this year, I interviewed them, two of them for my essay for the book, Freeze Frame. Um, so I met with um, a Sue and Bridget, who I'll say a bit more about in a moment. And I also interviewed the filmmaker Sue Bourne at the end of 2014. So um, here they all are. I'll say a few words about each of them. So um, Jean up here in the far left corner there. Um, so she met her husband at the age of 15, we learn. She'd been widowed a few years earlier after 56 years with him, which prompted her to kind of go out and get um, a job at the age of 70. And she talks about how she went up to, to the gap and said, I want a job. And she got a job on the spot and she become, became their eldest uh, employee. Uh, this is Bridget, who I mentioned that I um, met and interviewed. She's um, a former refugee and health worker who now campaigns on ageism and diversity. And the film is, is particularly interested in how she manages to maintain her style on a state pension by frequenting charity shops. So part of the film shows her kind of going into a charity shop and getting excited about the bargains in there. Uh, this is Gillian, um, who's a highly acclaimed dancer and choreographer. Um, works on Cats, for example, um, still working at nearly 90. Um, and the film shows her uh, happily marries for a number of decades to a man that's 27 years younger than her. And this is Daphne, who is now regarded as the world's oldest supermodel. And you might recognise her from the Guardian Weekend magazine, little um, Fashion for All Ages. Uh, article they do every week. Um, she had actually been a model in her younger days, um, but uh, gave that up to have a family and then restarted her long dormant modelling career at the age of 70, again, after she was widowed. This is Sue, Sue Kreitzman, who's the um, other fashionista that I interviewed. Um, possibly some of you might remember Sue Kreitzman, as she was once a very highly successful TV cook and food writer. Used to be on kind of Pebble Mill, things like that. But those of you who have been down the archives might have come across this. You can actually find um, excerpts of her on um, YouTube doing this, this work. Um, she's American, but lived in um, London for many years. So successful in that, in that um, occupation on both sides of the Atlantic. Now an artist um, curating and uh, creating her own kind of quirky folk style outsider art living in London's East End. Uh, and this is Baroness Trumpington. She sits in the House of Lords, was formerly the mayoress of Cambridge, um, who became an internet sensation in 2011 
after he was caught on camera flicking the V's at Lord King. <laughs> so <laughs> you might, you might recognise her from that. So we can see from those biographies then that the women subjects hold varying relationships to celebrity and visibility at the time of the film's making. So Gillian, Daphne, Sue and Baroness Trumpington were all formerly or currently public figures before becoming part of Fabulous Fashionistas. Um, so only Jean and Bridget were what we might call kind of ordinary subjects at the outset in that respect, who can bear witness then to this kind of uncommon experience of becoming recognised public figures as older women following the film's broadcast. So as I said then, precisely at the time in their lives that women are expected to forego their already delimited voice and any claim to being a subject of interest in the public world. Um, Jean, in particular, has gone on uh, to become a successful model since the documentary aired. Again, she also appears in The Guardian's Weekend magazine regularly. Um, and a portrait of her was exhibited at the National Portrait Gallery, winning second prize in the BP Portrait Award last year, as you can see there. And at the start of this year, Sue had an installation of her work at the flagship uh, Selfridges store in London with her own window display, so like right on the kind of the, 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 the forefront of the, the Oxford Street uh, windows as part of the um, Bright Old Things initiative. So usually at this time of year, Selfridges um, uh, do this um, right, new things uh, celebration of design. And this year they had um, um, sort of subverted that to make it Bright Old Things. Um, which was about celebrating the work of older designers. So people who had previously had another kind of occupation and had become designers later in life. So one could buy bags and notebooks featuring her artwork and jewellery by the hip designer Tatty Devine, featuring Sue's face, this kind of very recognisable, um, kind of iconic glasses and the white hair that she has. Um, and perhaps most significantly for my discussion, her kind of famous line from the documentary where she explains her passion for colour and vibrancy and declares, don't wear beige, it might kill you. <laughs> so, voila and voila. <laughs> um, yet, as Julia Twigg has noted in her wonderful study, Fashion and Age, conventionally, fashion and age sit uncomfortably together Fashion inhabits a world of youthful beauty, of fantasy, imagination, allure. Age, by contrast, is perceived as a time of greyness, marked by retirement from display or engagement with the erotic and style conscious. But does the success of fabulous fashionistas and the warm reception that met its stars speak of the possibility that we may be in a cultural moment where attitudes to ageing femininities in this respect may be changing? So there seem potentially to be at least tentative signs that popular culture might have started to become receptive at last to seeing older women resist the realm of cultural invisibility that they've historically been uh, relegated to. And this has been borne out further since Fabulous Fashionistas was broadcast in fashion and celebrity industries, for example, uh, in the number of um, high-profile advertising campaigns of late featuring older women. So um, just a few of these here, Charlotte Rampling, who became the face of NARS Cosmetics, aged 68 in 2014. Uh, Joan Didion, uh, aged 80, uh, modelling for Celine earlier this year. It's got hu huge amounts of uh, interest in the press when that uh, campaign started running. Um, alongside this, uh, we've seen the ongoing success of Ari Seth Cohen's Advanced Style blog. I don't know if any of you have um, looked at this. It's had more than six million hits. It's also be been a very successful book in its fourth edition and a documentary also called uh, Advanced Style came out early this year. Also early this summer, um, Alfred Mels has released his last documentary about 93-year-old New York style maven Iris Apfel. And in fact, Iris Apfel was also um, heading up two advertising campaigns earlier this year for Kate Spade and Alexis Bittar. So 
So kind of so widespread has this cultural shift in these industries become that in an interview, in my interview, um, Sue Kreitzman described it to me as an old lady revolution. And certainly what stood out most strikingly for me after watching Fabulous Fashionistas on its first broadcast was that sense of joy, both in the kind of um, uh, energy of the film itself and in the reception of the film. So in all the major newspaper coverage I examined following the film uh, being broadcast, only one columnist, Michelle Hansen in The Guardian, expressed reservations about it. And she noted that she had found the kind of line of the voiceover to be somewhat inane um, and was upset that she thought the subjects weren't interesting because they were old. She argued they were just interesting. And what she was criticising them was this kind of binary attitude that she thought the film was upholding, this kind of simplistic mindset of young versus old. Certainly it was this um, kind of palpable joie de vivre that we could see in the women, as much as their taste for dressing up, that had made them fitting subjects for the film, and which meant they were so affectionately received on broadcast. So Lynn, Daphne, Jean and Bridget all speak passionately at different points in the film about the importance of maintaining health and ongoing vitality through exercise. They're filmed undertaking this with uh, Lynn and Daphne advocating for uh, rigorous morning yoga and Pilates routines. All of them speak about the importance of work and staying active and interested in the world around us. So quite aside from anything we as viewers might think about their kind of individual styles, their, kind of their tastes, they're all aspirational visions of ageing well. But what other experiences are missing or what perspectives weren't acknowledged in the overwhelmingly positive reception of the film? While I left the film sharing the Twitterverse's sense of having been inspired, was there something, dare I say it, retrograde in the film too? Here we all were, rejoicing the fact of older women finally be being given a space like this on national TV. But what had earned them that platform? The contents of their wardrobes. So rather than uh, moving representation on, was the film instead just inserting older women into the trappings and the judgmental hierarchies that confine younger women, appraised, elevated or relegated alongside one another in regards to how they look. So as John Berger puts it in Ways of Seeing many years ago now, girls soon learn that much of their value is inscribed in how they look, i.e. to others and in being looked at. They learn to be both the surveyed and the surveyor of themselves. Decades down the line, were these women still moving through the world in this way, still party to this deeply gendered way of being? Aging activists and scholars calls to address the manner in which older women are rendered culturally invisible is of course a pressing political issue. But at the same time, there's a thread in some aspects of this work which speaks of the freedom that this invisibility can bring, of some women's relief at no longer having to expect or negotiate judgment about how they look and what they wear, since older age effectively removes them from this spectrum. So rather than offering new and inspiring images of ageing then, was the film merely championing the prolonging of this damaging regime. So in fact, at certain moments, a neoliberal discourse seems evident in it. So Gillian tells us, uh, for example, in a line that sounds something that could have come right, straight from a L'Oreal advert. She says, I think you have to pit yourself, if you like, against the ageing process, and you just mustn't allow it in. Drawing then on the beauty industry's anti-ageing idiom that encourages us to see ageing as an enemy that we must battle against. And these are women who have, in some ways, it seems, kind of adopted some of the rhetoric of post-feminism as Ros Gill has conceptualised it, despite its uh, post-feminism's uh, apparent preoccupation with young women as its primary subjects, so that they are enacting, quote, an emphasis upon self-surveillance, monitoring and self-discipline, 
and a focus on individualism, choice and empowerment. Furthermore, just as post-feminism has been understood also to speak to and of a white subject, all the women here are white and uh, indeed, as you'll have seen, a good number of them have maintained palpably lithe bodies that deny the physiological uh, changes that ageing can bring with it for many women. And the concerns of Director Seaborn's voiceover seem to lend themselves too to investment in post-feminism's familiar makeover paradigm. When reflecting on Jean's story, she tells us, maybe old age doesn't have to be so bad after all. Instead of your horizons shrinking, you could even find yourself with a brand new career. And yet, when I interviewed Sue Bourne, uh, she shared some salient insights that complicate this kind of easy dismissal of the film as being irredeemably compromised by that prescriptive gendered agenda. For Bourne, this was never a film about fashion or fashionistas. Indeed, Sue Kreitzman also understood it this way, um, telling me it's about life and death and hormones and everything. Bourne's impetus for making the film, she said, was a personal one, centred on trying to conceive of her own future ageing, which came from, quote, looking for a template for the next 30 years. So I want to show you an, another little clip from the film, which shows this sense in which the film seemingly was, but perhaps in actuality wasn't, about fashion. When you just get up and you just go around the corner to buy some vegetables, are you dressed like this? Yes, but, yes, but I'm sorry, yes. Couldn't bear to get up in the morning, especially going to work and you see, and start rummaging through wardrobes. No, I, I always looked them out before. Oh, the fluffies, the fluffies, the fluffies. I love fashion and I'm always interested in clothes. I used to make all my clothes. And this is one of my favorite outfits, which I've had a long time now. The Venus de Milo, which I bought in Channel Island. That's very cheap. That's a £20 suit. And I even go anywhere in it. And it's, I think, very good looking. Is that a catalogue bag? Cat oh, that's a ca catalogue. I think it's a catalogue called Chums. And if I like something, I tend to wear it a lot. So it doesn't bother me if I wore the same dress six days a week and had somebody would think, Heck, she's got that dress on again. That wouldn't enter my head. I'd put it on for me. I've always been interested in style. I like to think I'm street style more than smart. I wouldn't like somebody to come up and say, oh, you do look smart. By the time you reach your eighth decade, you'll have survived all the ups and downs life throws at you. Jean had lived a quiet life in Bath, working part-time in a deli to supplement the family income for her two sons and her beloved husband, Paul. I met him when I was 15 and he was 20. And um, I saw him and I fell in love with him immediately and he fell in love with me immediately. Well, that was the start of 56 years together, which is a very, very long time. And when I lost him, well, I was, I was devastated right now. I'm not the only one, notably. So that when he went, I had really, other than my family, I really didn't have anybody. And about a month had passed, and my son visited me, and he said, I said, Guy, I said, I think I'm going to... Um, go and see if I can get something in a charity shop. So he thought for a moment, he said, the mother, there's nothing wrong with working in charity shops. He said, but I don't think it's, it's for you. He said, you want something with a bit more life. So I said, but, uh, I said, uh, I'm turned 70. I said, who'll want me? He said, somebody will want you. So I said, where, where will I go when I'm turned 70? So he thought for a couple of minutes and had his laugh afterwards, because he said, Gab, I went to Gap and they gave me the job immediately. Jean was Gap's oldest employee and
and stayed there for just over a year. Then she decided she needed a change and started work in the trendy boutique opposite. She's been there for five years now. Going back to work has given Jean's life a whole new dimension. So, again then, as Bourne put it, I was looking for a template for the next 30 years, she says. That was my starting point, looking for role models in an era where she believes baby boomers are, quote, pioneers who are redefining the ageing process. So she went on to explain, but I knew if I went to any broadcaster in Britain and went, I want to make a film about these wonderful older feisty women, they would tell me to take a hike. They would not be interested at all. So I had to come up with a way to conceal the fact that I was talking about age. I saw a ghost in there. <laughs> and I just sort of pretended, really, that it was about style, but it isn't. It was just snuck in under the wire, which is what you have to do. So for Bourne, then, the film was always about capturing the attitude and spirit, spirit of vibrant older women. And she explained that she disliked the film's title and that fashion was merely, quote, the hook that enabled her to get a commission. And again, as Sue Kreitzman described it in an interview, she said that fashion was a MacGuffin to talk about ageing and life. So this snuck-in agenda, as Bourne puts it, is there in her voiceover in the film at times. For example, Bridget takes on the women's magazine industry and challenges them to hire her as a model instead of yet another teenager. Uh, and in the voiceover, uh, Bourne observes that what was becoming clear was that for all six women, their style and attitude was not just about the clothes they wore. They all have the same steely determination. They all share a quality, a spirit that keeps them going. And um, when I did the interview, I, I spoke to, to Bridget about that because I was interested to know did they set up the whole um, storyline about her taking on the uh, advertising industry for older models? And uh, Bridget said that she was already doing that work. But what had happened was that being part of the documentary had enabled her to get access to go to the Vogue offices, which we see in the film. But it wasn't, just, it wasn't a setup entirely for the purposes of the film. So um, Bourne was also well aware of the film's lack of diversity and frustrated by it. And she described the enormously difficult struggle she'd had to find her subjects. So I'd begun by telling her that I was, I was kind of pleased to see that there was a kind of breadth of class identities in the film. So we weren't just kind of hearing about how uh, kind of wealth enabled you to be stylish, importantly, because of Bridget. Um, and then she said, but you can see what it's lacking. It's got absolutely no cultural diversity whatsoever. And I was absolutely hammered for that. And she also went on to bemoan its regionalism, noting it was embarrassing that uh, most of her subjects came from London. But she said she could find no solution for this. Uh, she could only tell me, falling back in frustration, that alongside the style criteria, so you know, to become considered as a subject for the film, you had to have some, some kind of like interesting connection with, with clothes and style. Um, also, she decided that she wanted all the women to be at least 70 and that this condition had made her pool of potential subjects smaller still. So she says it was hard enough, quote, as simply finding them at 70, 80 and 90. It's very possible then that some viewers may leave this film frustrated that in some ways it depicts a positive future for ageing women as one where they still caught the gaze. And that later life kind of female sort of celebrity or recognition is most readily to be won on that basis. But in some ways, this simply crystallises the problem that fashion has long held for feminism. On one side of the debate, pleasure in the superficialities of dress, cosmetics and appearance is a poisoned chalice that curtails and delimits the way women function in the world. And on the other, it's a feminine realm that brings with it the possibility of creativity, escapism and self-expression. As Paulicelli and Wissinger put it, condensing this dilemma into two effective questions. Can a woman who loves clothing and cares about the way she looks still be politically and intellectually engaged 
and most importantly, taken seriously? Are fashion and feminism a contradiction in terms? Now, Bridget's continued activism undoubtedly provides an affirmative answer to Paula Celli and Wisinger's first question. So she has started to use the film as a, as a kind of platform to enrich her lobbying. So she now incorporates fabulous fashionistas into her work. So in an interview, she explained that she's adopted the film as an educational tool in the ageism workshops that she runs with schools and care workers. Um, something which I think kind of underlines this sense that fabulous fashionistas was actually making some quite weighty social commentary from behind that seemingly frivolous title. Um, and she um, believed that by showing extracts from the film in her ageism awareness sessions, she was helping to instigate a change in attitudes among the people she works with. So she said, I notice when I do the workshops in the before brainstorm and the after brainstorm, their perception changed, even if just for a short while. And one must suppose also that all the women are happy to be the focus of attention or object of the gaze. After all, they've all willingly submitted to featuring in a documentary where the style will be scrutinised. Sue and Bridget admit to this freely in the film, and in an interview, both of them spoke about the pleasure they took in being recognised in public. And um, Sue especially um, talked about people often stop and photograph her and come and um, strike, com strike up conversation with her. Uh, and importantly, this is harnessed to a repeated pronouncement by the subjects in the film that they, quote, couldn't give a damn, as Gillian puts it, about what anyone thinks of how they look, and that they dress for themselves. And you saw that there in the little snippet of Jean as well. And so unusual is the film's image of older women outside of culturally dominant images of either dependency, fragility, or care facilitator that we can say they did indeed become Bourne's hoped for role models for viewers seeking alternative images of ageing. So Sue's now quite, kind of, uh, quite famous line where she tells us that she thinks beige is the colour of death and so warns us, don't wear beige, it might kill you, has almost become a kind of pithy rallying call for ageing women to resist the pressure to fade into in invisibility. So the fact that you can put it on on a pendant around your neck says something. In existing critical work here, Sadie Waring has provided an important discussion of recent media representations of kind of revitalised older women. And her invoking of the term rejuvenation has been widely adopted as a kind of term, to, as a way of talking about this growing, if tentative, shift towards what we might call um, more optimistic, animated, spirited, representations of older women than we've been used to. But I want to um, revisit this term, rejuvenation, at this time, and ask whether, in some instance, instances, we might adopt the word reinvigoration. Um, both rejuvenation and reinvigoration speak to the notion of kind of re-embracing aliveness. But to be reinvigorated is not as rejuvenated is to reclaim youth. So the OED online notes that the origin of the word rejuvenate springs from the early 19th century from re for again, plus the Latin uh, juvenus for young. Thus, when we suggest that these older women's vibrancy is evidence of rejuvenation, we risk the continued fetishization of youth and the conflation of youth with aliveness, an entanglement that we need to move away from if we're to foster more nuanced perceptions of aging. Youth, or the illusion of it, is not the thing sought after in fabulous fashionistas. So in Bridget's words, she says, how I look is to do with my identity and the fun of it. It's nothing to do with looking younger. I don't dress like this to look young because I don't think it makes me look young. In contrast, the OED uh, defines reinvigorated as, quote, give new energy or strength to without any recourse to situating energy and strength within the realm of the young. But even this term may not suffice, since to use it points to women's later life accomplishments 
as always being born of a kind of reawakening. So this idea that you have to have, um, kind of aim to have this kind of a second wind in older age. And this may easily be co-opted by a neoliberal imperative to keep making over the self throughout life. And this is indeed how fabulous fashionistas consciously constructs the narratives of a number of its subjects. And I think particularly Daphne and Jean, who are spoken about, about taking their lives in new directions when they were widowed. But for other older women, women it may be more appropriate to draw on a language which points to how they've maintained vibrancy, curiosity, activity throughout the life course. And for example, Gillian here is a good example of this, who's worked solidly as a dancer and choreographer well into her eighth decade. Or Sue, who describes how she segued from a successful career as a, as a, as a TV cook, whilst actually still at the height of her uh, success as a cook, I think in her, in her 50s, into this new passion for art and curating without pause. So part, part of the challenge for academics then is that just as we lack an ample repertoire of images of aging and older women, so too have scholars and cultural commentators struggled with the lack of a sufficient lexicon to speak about aging. So in a New York Times blog, for example, uh, the writer Judith Graham polled a number of leading figures working in ageing studies and ageing research for their views on what terminology we should start to adopt. And uh, the Director of Academic Affairs for the AARP, the American Association for, for Retired People, uh, Harry Moody, observed, what's going on is we have a problem with the subject itself. Everyone wants to live longer, but no one wants to be old. So to conclude, um, I want to think very briefly about what other work we need to do next. Um, and it's the absence of work um, among viewers themselves, women themselves exploring the reception and negotiation of the themes and the images that I've touched on today. Um, so work that examines the complex set of reactions in, and interpretations that women audiences can actually bring to bear on images of aging and older women celebrities. This poses a large and kind of pressing absence in celebrity studies at this time. There are a lot of presumptions made about how women actually feel about these images. So they aspire to be like one woman, they despise another, who's had bad surgery, who's aging gracefully, et cetera, et cetera. When actually there's been really kind of next to no actual audience studies work undertaken with older and aging women themselves regarding how these representations actually feature in their own aging narratives. Um, and I think that's, that's part of a kind of bigger cultural problem about not giving older women a, a, a voice in public life in uh, you know, everyday spaces once you're past a certain age. Um, that problem has carried over into the research in, in um, our field, not so much in gerontology, but within our kind of work. So again, then we see the absence of older women's own voices in articulating their experience. It remains to be seen whether the recent fashion for older women models in high profile campaigns will be just that, a fashion to be dropped in the next season. Or as Bridget put it to me, a bunch of advertisers jumping on the bandwagon. What might be learned by speaking with older women themselves about such images? Our ageing population is a demographic shift which is certainly with us for the foreseeable future. And therefore we're going to be increasingly driven to understand how to facilitate, how to enhance ageing well. And in such a climate, work which tries to understand how media representations of ageing femininity actually contribute to women's perceptions and experience of their own ageing processes remains an underwritten, under-resourced arena of study. Uh, so until we do that work, in the meantime, don't wear beige. <laughs> Thank you.